Hi. Um, I've known Milo here for a really long time, and he was brave enough to come and be our keynote, even though I know enough dirt on him to probably embarrass him several times over. But I'm not going to. <clears throat> anyway, so I met Milo virtually in 1989 when I was in the Merritt Knock, and um, there was an earthquake in California. And one of the Knock operators happened to be exchanging email with Milo at the time of the earthquake. <laughs> And um, Milo said, wow, there's an earthquake. It's the biggest shake of my life. I better leave the building now. And um, I don't think Milo knows this, but at that point, the Ann Arbor News thought that was super cool. They came to the knock. They, they put Milo's email on the evening news. <laughs> and they interviewed our PR person at the NSF net who said, they asked her why it was that the network was still up when you couldn't make a phone call. And she very sincerely de described how the phone lines were actually suspended above the ground, whereas the network was buried. <laughs> and so therefore, it was impervious to earthquakes, <laughs> which I thought was super duper funny. <laughs> So the second time I met Milo virtually, we were having a regional text meeting, which is what Nanog used to be. And we were all in this little conference room, and the topic of discussion was um, how the network was saturated because Milo was playing a war game with his friends. <laughs> of course, it wasn't even T1 then. Anyway, so I worked with Milo at home, which was a really good time, and now Milo is the um, VP of Access at Google, and I don't want to take any more time from his fabulous talk, so we'll just enjoy. Thanks. Thank you, Kathy. Um, wow, it's been a long time since I've been at Nanog. This is a different kind of place. I know maybe five or six people here. Um, the, the uh, it uh, as one of the old guys, um, I guess Kathy wanted me to come and give a talk about uh, the history of the internet. But to borrow a phrase from Peggy Noonan's book, um, I think uh, this is more about what I saw at the revolution and really what the internet, uh, the history of the internet, is a story of revolution. Um, I was an early ARPANET user when I was in high school in uh, the Central Valley of California. I actually had an Apple II, and uh, I bought a cat modem. Any of you remember these acoustic coupler modems? Okay. 300 baud. Um, I heard about the ARPANET from uh, folks at the local university at Fresno State, and um, I dialed long distance into the TIP, right, which was the uh, old uh, name for terminal servers in those days uh, of the ARPANET and just started exploring. One of the great things about the net and back in those days was um, it wasn't that important to people, right? So you could uh, actually fool around quite a bit on it and, uh, and this was not really frowned upon. Um, there was a computer called MITMC where I got my first email account. Um, it ran the incompatible time sharing system, ITS. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the funny things was if you tried to log in and you didn't have an account, it would say, would you like me to make you an account? And so uh, that was my first email account. Um, I went to school at UC Berkeley and majored in computer science. Um, and there I learned about Unix. I learned about the ARPANET and later about TCP IP. Uh, one of the fun things I, I did was uh, actually get a chance to work on defense programs at Livermore Lab. And I always thought uh, working with nuclear weapons design was always a good uh, background for dealing with competing with incumbents. Um, in uh, both places, though, one of the great things was that you got to see computers from different kinds of manufacturers all working together. Uh, that wasn't the way most of the world worked back then. Uh, I moved to NASA uh, in 1985 and joined a brand new networking group. Uh, NASA was mostly a deck shop uh, running VAXs, though at the manned space centers uh, they were IBM mainframe based. Um, so uh, I was the only tech guy in the group. And so what did I do? Well, we ran Unix on VAXs just like we did at Berkeley. 
and uh, became an advocate for TCPIP. Uh, and later, uh, my team had the opportunity to uh, build NASA's uh, backbone system. Um, which brings us up to the, my first encounter with the IETF. Uh, that was in 1986. I was 23 years old at the time. Uh, and they were, the, the great thing about the, the net back in those days was if you really wanted to advance the internet, you were really welcome. It was like, ah, another soldier for the fight. Uh, because at the time, the internet was not the dominant uh, protocol. Uh, we had SNA and uh, the IBM world, the DEC world, uh, and uh, the internet was anything but a sure thing. Um, the community was tightly knit. Um, this is the attendance list of that first IETF back uh, in 1986 that I attended. I think it was the fourth one. Uh, and you could see the usual suspects there from BBNN, uh, from uh, SRI, uh, the, the old days of the, uh, of the internet. Um, and uh, uh, 35 people attending an IETF meeting. It hasn't, it's amazing. This, this group used to be that small a long, long time ago. And uh, now we're as, uh, as big as the IETF uh, once was. Uh, the status of the net back in 1986. There were uh, 3,082 hosts. You knew that because everybody had to be in the host table. Because uh, the internet hadn't converted over to the DNS at, at that time. Uh, the interesting thing was, you know, 515 uh, total networks, 144 internet gateways, uh, what routers used to be called in those days. Uh, we had uh, the ARPANET and the MILNET had just been split apart. Uh, these were... Uh, the old uh, uh, BBN C30s acting as, as packet switches, and they had the famous 1822 interface by ACC, um, which was later upgraded to X25, which was a terrible thing. And uh, Craig Partridge and I always used to joke about uh, how uh, uh, we needed to make t-shirts that said 1822 Uber Alles. Now that's a really inside joke. Of uh, people know 1822, which was the old protocol uh, that the uh, host talked to the imps with. What were we dealing with in 1986? EGP was having problems. Uh, there was no BGP back then, and uh, EGP, as uh, as folks uh, always uh, uh, had to remind folks, was not a routing protocol; it was a reachability protocol, which worked fine in the days when uh, topology was was relatively sparse. But as uh, topology started growing, uh, we had uh, lots of issues. Uh, the ARPANET was uh, getting congested. Only 5% of the host pairs on the ARPANET were consuming 50% of the total network capacity. Funny how things don't seem to change. Um, the DNS was still in early stages of de deployment. Many sites still use the old host.txt file. Uh, people, I remember Paul Makapetris, uh, who I uh, later work with at, at home, uh, was there and he was uh, surprised actually that uh, they were getting so many negative hits, that is people were typing in the wrong name and it wouldn't, uh, wouldn't uh, resolve. And uh, uh, we also had fuzzballs, uh, the NSS first backbone. Uh, connected with 56 kilobit links was being uh, turned on. These were small DEC LSI 11 uh, computers uh, acting as routers. Uh, David Mills from uh, uh, University of Delaware was the author of that code base and um, they were really uh, odd little creatures. Um, almost as soon as the network became uh, active, it was overloaded. Um, and Dave had to put in uh, the first instance of network management code that I was uh, aware of. Uh, he uh, put in prioritization so that telnet traffic and TCP acts would get priority over FTP and email. Uh, and he had a saying which was, uh, in the jungle, if you want to protect the mice, you have to shoot the elephants. Um, it is interesting that uh, 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 we actually were doing network management and traffic shaping even in this uh, time. Uh, outside of the U.S., most of the networks ran on the old X25 public data network system, and uh, IP running over that was not optimal. There was a lot of discussion about 
uh, how to try and, and uh, finesse this, to try and bring the rest of the world onto the internet. And then we had this thing called the ISO stack. I was actually uh, surprised. The ISO uh, the International Standards Organization had a competing protocol at that time. Uh, and everybody in the room, pretty much everybody in the room, thought that uh, eventually TCP IP would be replaced by this thing. Um, it was uh, uh, something that was uh, 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 not really well optimized. It had a connection-less stack and a connection-full stack. And now, uh, like uh, uh, many other technologies, is now on, uh, on the ash heap of history uh, as the uh, Internet ran over it. And, uh, and we see what, uh, what's, what's happened since then. Uh, there was a conversation with the Internet Network Architecture uh, Committee who was meeting with the ITF at the time. Blue sky thinking about the future. So I just thought I would put this up. These were considered the mid-range issues and a long-term blue sky vision. Not that anybody would, would think we could possibly get there. Um, there was a lot of things on the medium, midterm list that didn't actually get done. But uh, on the long-term list, it's really interesting, right? Uh, people were talking about uh, scaling the Internet to millions, hundreds of millions of endpoints, speeds that would be uh, in the gigabit range, uh, applications accessing uh, uh, the Internet at 10 to 100 megabits, uh, issues of security, resource control, how to drive costs down, cellular and mobility uh, were, were being discussed even back in 1986. And it um, is a testimony to the uh, vision of the folks who were leading uh, the Internet R&D community at that time. Uh, backbone networks then began to be constructed. Uh, in 1987, the NSF awarded the second NSF net backbone contract to Merit, IBM, and MCI. Uh, and they used IBM PCRT routers. Uh, these were uh, RTs running uh, software, running Unix, and uh, acting as, as routers, uh, stitching regional networks together uh, and supercomputing centers, and that came up in 1988. Um, at, Initially, at, at my uh, uh, shop, uh, we uh, got the job to build our own backbone uh, to link NASA facilities together. Uh, they were initially trunked at 56 kilobits, later via T1s. Uh, we used Proteon routers at the time, an old, old uh, name from history. Uh, they were multi-bus based uh, systems, uh, basically uh, 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 small computers, uh, 68,000 computers in a box, and uh, we also carry DECnet around. One of the things that was um, uh, an issue back in these days was the fight over uh, the, the, what the protocol wars. You had the digital equipment company uh, corporation pushing its DECnet uh, stack uh, and saying, don't move to TCP IP, the inter ISO will come and you just stay on the, on the uh, DECnet path and, and you will arrive in the international uh, standard. Um, this raised a lot of politics in the agency um, and uh, eventually it was decided that we would move both IP and DECnet on a common, common network platform so we could aggregate the capacity. Uh, my friends at uh, Livermore at uh, the Department of Energy began their own uh, IP DECnet backbone effort and uh, deployed it in 1988 as well. Uh, federal networks partnered. One of the great things in those days was the, uh, even though the Internet was effectively run by the U.S. government and the agencies, we partnered with each other uh, so that we could, NASA would use NSF's links, NSF would use uh, our links, uh, one of our favorite projects was there was this crazy guy in Hawaii named Torben Nielsen. Uh, and uh, Torben was, uh, wanted to connect up uh, sites in the, uh, in the uh, Pacific Rim. Uh, we uh, we uh, struck an agreement with uh, several uh, countries to basically say, look, we'll pull the Internet to you if you'll connect our investigators inside your country. And... Uh, uh, Jeff Houston at Arnet uh, and, uh, and, and others remember this, right? Uh, when the, back in the old days, uh, we turned on, I think it was 112 kilobit link uh, to Australia. Was that the f 56 at the start? 
Um, and uh, NASA operated that network as part of, uh, as part of our agreement. Uh, we allowed, uh, we expressly wanted to encourage countries to build their own infrastructure and created the, the pipe. It was interesting because in most uh, nations, people didn't really want to talk to each other with the internet. But if you put a pipe in to the, to the, to the rest of the world, they'd build connectivity internally uh, to actually get to that. And, uh, and that uh, worked, over, worked really well. Uh, over time, costs shifted. Uh, more and more costs were borne by the, by the nations, and eventually we could, we could get out of the business. It was a great way to build infrastructure. Um, this is a picture of, of the NASA network uh, back in uh, 1991. Um, I think we, at the time we had the highest and lowest latitudes uh, in the network. We had a satellite circuit uh, to a uh, research site at Thule Air Force Base in Greenland, and we also had a satellite circuit uh, to McMurdo Base in the, uh, in the Antarctic. Um, to get to uh, McMurdo was a real uh, problem because, you know, uh, satellites are in geostationary orbit. And so when you're down really south, it's, you can't have good look angle on the spacecraft. We got a good deal on a wobbly satellite who had lost its station keeping fuel. And so it turned out to be in an orbit that was, uh, was good. We moved a nine meter satellite earth station on an island, Black Island, 40 clicks north of McMurdo Base, assembled it, uh, and then built a microwave relay across the ice cap to uh, McMurdo Base. And uh, that was good enough to get uh, something like half a T1 of uh, internet capacity down there, which was muxed and they could use it for phone calls, et cetera. There was a storm at one point which collapsed the roof of the administration building at McMurdo, uh, knocking out the HF uh, uh, shortwave radios that they used to communicate. But the uh, satellite connection stayed up. And so uh, coordinating uh, flights into uh, the Antarctic was done uh, via, uh, via that link. Um, and later, uh, we actually put a ground station at McMurdo and one at uh, South Pole Station. And there was an old uh, polar orbiting weather sat that had a, a transponder that was still uh, functioning. And uh, a certain uh, part of the day would pop up over the uh, South Pole and uh, users at South Pole would uplink data back down to McMurdo Base and, uh, and get their email and science data uh, moved around. Uh, those were the fun days, you know, when 56 kilobit actually uh, got you something. Uh, uh, we had numbers of interconnection issues in these days. Uh, in 98, the backbones interconnected with each other in haphazard ways, usually through regional networks. EGP was being used between uh, networks, but protocols like RIP and IGRP uh, didn't do a particularly good job of carrying the external data from one part of the region out to the other. And this was causing a lot of route flapping and, uh, and uh, other uh, issues that, that affected reliability. Uh, Hans Werner Rahn from uh, Merit and uh, NSF and I were talking about this one, one night in uh, 1988. And we said, you know, this is stupid. We should just interconnect directly with each other um, and build uh, points of, uh, of interconnection. Um, we put a... Uh, co-located Ethernet concentrator, not even a switch in those days, uh, and we would not route inner backbone traffic through the regionals anymore. We would just uh, peer with each other directly. Uh, we had a, a building uh, as our telecommunications facility that we used to blow things up in. Uh, it, was it was relatively secure. It had something like 12 inch thick concrete walls, uh, and so it was decided that we would uh, be the host for this uh, we discussed the idea of our bosses, and the next day they gave approval. Uh, the NSFNet had a uh, T1 uh, uh, hub at uh, Palo Alto, at Barnett, and then they extended an RT up to our site. Uh, ESNet and the uh, Milnet extended uh, networks, and so uh, we actually uh, had our first real peering interconnect. And the Internet was called the FIBA. How many of you here know what FIBA stands for? So it's the forward edge of the battle area, right? It's a military term, which is basically the front line. We, we called it that because we thought it was the front line of routing. 
Uh, and in fact, the Ethernet hub network itself was called the DMZ, or the Demilitarized Zone, uh, which made sense if you thought of it as the front line of routing. Uh, I think this was the first use of the term DMZ back in those days. Uh, later, for political reasons, we had to change the name. Mark Pullen, who was the uh, 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 head of uh, the DARPA office that ran the, uh, the uh, research network, said, I am not going to go in front of Congress and testify about this thing called the FIBA. So change the name. You have to change the name. So we uh, changed it to the Federal Interconnect Exchange, or FIX. And that's uh, how the FIX uh, came about. Uh, but the, the DMZ uh, name still uh, stayed uh, true. We had lots of problems uh, back in those days. The Morris worm uh, in, uh, the, in November of 88 uh, erupted. We had lots of uh, Unix machines at Ames, and we were hit uh, with that early. Uh, we made the decision to turn off the network interfaces at the NASA field centers. Um, and uh, we, that allowed us to uh, keep control of the, of the backbone, but uh, actually saved a bunch of them from getting infected. 36 hours later, the worm was, was better understood. I remember that, uh, that time being on the phone with my friends at Berkeley who were trying to uh, uh, debug what this thing was doing and how it was doing it. Uh, in about 36 hours later, patches were available, and the worst was, was basically over, though we still had infections uh, 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 at various sites uh, uh, after that. Um, that was, the, I think, the, uh, the death of innocence uh, on, the, on the Internet, uh, that we would be able to be targeted and uh, affected uh, like that. Um, we also ran a root name server, and like many other root name servers, these were targets for hackers. Uh, there a number of funny stories uh, that I could tell you about uh, uh, dealing with hackers. Uh, we had uh, one instance where there was, uh, at a university in Finland, a guy we kept trying to break into the root. Um, so I called up the folks at the university, and uh, nobody would do anything about it. Eventually, I talked to folks at Nordunet, uh, who wouldn't do anything about it. So um, I said, to my friend Elise Garrick uh, at, uh, at Merit, hey, could you just put a, a small route in, a route to the null interface for his network? Because that would get their attention, right? And she said, well, we don't really want to do that kind of thing. We don't have a procedure for doing that. Why don't you talk to Sergio Hecker at, uh, at the John Von Neumann Supercomputer Center? Because that's where the 112 kilobit circuit to all of Scandinavia came in. Uh, so I sent him an email about it. Uh, he preferred a more blunt approach. He went into the machine room uh, where the uh, circuit was located and put the uh, link into loopback, uh, uh, turning off connectivity to all of Scandinavia. Um, needless to say, behavior modification works. And, uh, and uh, they didn't bother us again. We had another situation uh, where there was a, a, a hacker trying to break in, and uh, he was on a um, coming in from an address. It turned out back finger worked in those days. You remember finger? You could actually see uh, who was logged into the machine and what jobs they were running. And it was clear there was a user on a, some Apollo workstation uh, at MIT, and uh, he was trying to uh, to to do this. So I fired up a talk session. I said, "Hey." Stop doing this as a U.S. government computer. Don't mess around with it. He, ah, you can't do anything, blah, 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 blah. So then I informed him that uh, all computers that run TCP IP, because it was a DOD protocol, uh, had a special trap door built into them. And if uh, you were to cause a problem, I would, if you didn't stop doing this, I would exercise the trap door and take your machine out. And he's, oh, nothing but, well, the Apollos back in those days had a bug in their kernel. Uh, and it turned out it believed ICMP messages from uh, anybody that would send it. Uh, and we had a little program that faked ICMP messages. So uh, I sent the machine a ICMP redirect to my address, my host, to his loopback address, and then issued a flood ping. And at that point, the kernel 
forward the packets at, at kernel priority and panic the machine. Uh, and I was told afterwards that he kept telling people, it's true. There's a, there's a trap door in every network implementation out there that the government can control. Uh, we also had uh, problems with porn. Uh, uh, back in those days, we had an appropriate use policy. And uh, delivery of porn across the federal networks was, was not considered in compliance with this. Uh, we had to police it because we didn't want to be uh, hauled up to the hill saying, why is taxpayer money going for the distribution of pornography? Um, and have our funding cut off because of that. Also, our international links were modest. In particular, the link to Australia was 112 kilobits. And uh, the Aussies were very good at finding porn on the internet, as it turns out. Uh, and the link would redline. And then it was like, oh my god, it's like, how are we going to find this? Uh, fortunately, uh, I don't think people knew about this. Uh, the fix at the time was a shared ethernet, right? So we had a spark station that was plugged into it. And we would put it into promiscuous mode, that's an ethernet interface, run TCP dump, and we actually had software that could reassemble the TCP sessions. So we would actually be able to see the FTP request coming in uh, for the file. And uh, uh, what people would do back in those days is they would find some server somewhere, some host, that had an open FTP server, and they would plug their, uh, they would hide porn in directories named dot, right, and dot, 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 and stuff like this. And so uh, then we would just call up the, uh, the site and inform them that they were hosting porn and it would get turned off, and the link would go back down to, to normal bandwidth. Occasionally, we ran into problems with universities that did not want to, um, for various reasons, uh, turn it off. So uh, I had a friend of mine at Berkeley who uh, uh, would post under the, on Usenet under the pseudonym Red Meat. And I would have him post the, uh, the uh, location of the porn on, U on UUNet. Uh, Within about 15 minutes, the site was totally barraged with uh, requests, and uh, they would uh, then have to uh, turn it off uh, in order to deal with the network congestion. These were the kinds of problems uh, we had back in, uh, back in the old days. Not that we have them today. Uh, traffic continued to grow, and uh, the T1s became uh, congested. Uh, you know, we moved from EGP to BGP, which was a real routing protocol. The backbone networks all had to upgrade, but the costs were high and the equipment was immature. Uh, you know, the uh, NSF networks, uh, with their uh, uh, awarded an upgrade to ANS, uh, Advanced Network and Services, a nonprofit comprised of Merit, IBM, and MCI, and their DS3 based network came in, up in 1992. We and the folks at ESNet partnered. Uh, on a, uh, on a uh, uh, procurement. And we went to go talk to MCI, at and and Sprint, and WorldCom about using either frame relay or ATM uh, as our transport uh, to uh, uh, basically reduce the cost of this. I remember a particularly funny interaction. Uh, we went to the at and facility in Warren, New Jersey, and uh, that's where the uh, GCNS 2000, the old ATM switch, was, was, was being built. And, uh, we, uh, we were, said, you know, the handler said, uh, you know, the food is here, breakfast is over here, blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, please don't use the drinking fountains, and then moved on. So I raised my hand. I said, um, why not use the drinking fountains? Oh, we have a groundwater contamination problem here. So and moved on, and then I said, excuse me, but, but if you have a groundwater contamination problem, why don't you just turn them off? Oh no, they're for the employees to use. Uh, ultimately, uh, after a couple of protests, which are uh, common in uh, government contracting, uh, we, uh, we contracted with Sprint, and uh, we brought up our own uh, networks, the Fix West and Fix East at the time, uh, were upgraded uh, to FDDI to support the load, uh, and the internet really started uh, started going. Um, here's a fa 
picture that's relatively uh, famous uh, showing the traffic growth uh, back from 1988 all the way to 1994 uh, of the NSF net uh, backbone. As you can see, um, you know, uh, fuzzballs replaced by T1s and then eventually by uh, the ANS network. Uh, the internet turned uh, commercial. Uh, the internet had grown so fast and was supplanting other networks that uh, real companies started getting interested in it. People who work, uh, companies uh, represented in this room. There were several internet operators uh, at the time. Alternet, uh, which was part of UUNet, PSINet, SprintLink had all begun operation. The KICS was formed, the Commercial Internet Exchange was formed uh, in 1991 to allow commercial operators to interconnect. Uh, the ANS folks had gotten special permission uh, from the NSF to go ahead and, and uh, uh, allow commercial use of that s system as long as it did not um, uh, disrupt the main NSF net system, uh, main NSF net services. Uh, when the government does something uh, that's controversial, uh, people complain, right? Uh, and so there were uh, a number of, of folks uh, who complained, and the NSF, rather than fight all of this, basically said, you know, it's time to get out of this business. Uh, and uh, so uh, issued a solicitation uh, for network access points, which would allow the regionals to interconnect and allow different backbone operators to then come in, attach to the, to the uh, network access points, commercial operators, uh, and, and transition out of uh, service uh, provided by, by the federal government. Um, uh, many of the regional networks at this time were thinking about becoming commercial or, uh, or doing that themselves. One of the new NAPs in particular was run by Pacific Bell. They used a new bridge ATM switch. Um, this was a, just a horrid nightmare. It was a piece of awful, um, uh, a total disaster. Uh, it had huge kinds of packet loss uh, and uh, was a big mess. Uh, in 1994, Sean Duran and, uh, and Andrew Partant from uh, UUNet uh, came to me and said, we want you to open up the federal network exchange point, the fix, to commercial traffic. Now, uh, just a piece of advice. If your customers ever go to the federal government saying, we want you, the federal government, to do something because we can't get our needs met by your company, this is a big problem, right? Um, so, you know, we hadn't thought about how to do this, but NASA's it, it an odd place, and so one of the things that we have under the Space Act, the, the uh, uh, enabling legislation for NASA, allowed us to sell time uh, on unique national facilities. This was put in for, like, launch ranges, uh, launch sites, uh, wind tunnels, etc. We would sell time to Boeing to test out new airplanes. So we actually managed to construct a Space Act agreement declaring the, our telecom facility a unique national asset. Uh, and this allowed us to uh, sell uh, uh, access to uh, commercial entities to the facility on a cost recovery basis. So we put up a new FDDI ring. The government uh, uh, networks were dual-homed. Commercial networks would then interconnect on the, on the FIDI. Um, and, uh, and voila, we had a working uh, interconnect. Uh, eventually, lots of people wanted to attach, but our facilities were not big enough to house everyone. So um, you know, the May East uh, uh, at the time was operating really well, and so we uh, worked with, uh, with the folks at MFS to put a bridge link in between our facility at Ames and the, uh, the MF MFS hub site at, uh, in downtown San Jose. And so uh, the big guys were at Moffett, and the little guys would basically connect up at uh, connect up at, uh, in San Jose at MFS, and eventually both the links were upgraded to, I think, a one an OC3 at one point with dead giga switches uh, to bridge the traffic, and over time, uh, the interconnection moved pretty much all exclusively to, uh, to MFS in San Jose. Steve's nodding his head. He'll keep me, another old guy here, keeping me honest. Uh, so I just wanted to say, at this point, you know, some new technologies came out, and the Internet has really been riding 
on the backs of these technologies for some time. Um, the Net Netscape was formed after Mosaic was, was released. I remember, uh, you remember, uh, are those of you old enough to remember when Mosaic first came out? Yeah, so I got a phone call from a friend of mine, I was still at NASA at the time, uh, at Berkeley, and he said, Milo, have you seen this thing, Mosaic? I go, yeah. He says, you've got to stop it. <laughs> and I'm like, well, Phil, um, you know, I, I work for government, but I don't exactly have the power to do that. He goes, you have to stop it. I go, why are you so excited about this? Don't you understand? This thing allows you to use graphics and all kinds of things. Anybody can use it now. And it's inefficient. Because at least with Gopher, you'd get a link and you'd download the thing. You wouldn't start a download until you actually got the file that you wanted. This thing, you'd be clicking through. Who knows what you could, you know, download. It'll destroy the internet. You have to stop it. And uh, there's a certain amount of truth into that. And that is to say, um, one of the things that we can do is we can throw bandwidth away or, or do things that are less efficient from a bandwidth and network perspective to improve user interface uh, and, and generate a better experience that allows users to get their productivity done in, in, in better ways. At Livermore, we used to run uh, the craze in interactive mode, not batch, uh, like many folks did. And, um, and even though that was technically not efficient, it was much more productive because you could see a run going south on you, you could abort the job and then uh, and, and, uh, and fix it. Uh, and, and this was the same kind of thing. Uh, the problem, of course, is this fueled a massive growth in users, devices, and server-based applications. It really allowed uh, the web, right, allowed computing to move from the edge in, into what was then not called the cloud. Um, but that's the, the, the ride that we've been on. Um, of course, that drives the need for bandwidth. And dial-up networking at the time was really not uh, able to sustain the kind of uh, interface and experience that, that, uh, that the new browser systems wanted uh, to be able to provide. The other thing that really saved our bacon uh, was DWDM, right? Uh, the cost of uh, photonics, and the cost of uh, 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 transport allowed, uh, DWN allowed that to decline very rapidly. And what that meant was you're in a system where traffic was growing, the next increment of capacity that you added to your network was cheaper than the last increment. And as long as the next increment is always cheaper than the last increment, your average cost keeps declining. And so, uh, in a system where volume is growing at, at an astounding rate, um, if you don't have that dynamic going on, prices have to come up, rationing has to be implemented. But we have written this a long, long way. Uh, DWM first started being deployed in the, in the mid-90s and now is extensively deployed even on metro networks. Um, we also had a similar thing going on with, with Moore's Law and Schugert's Law. Uh, basically uh, reducing the cost of CPU MIPS and storage. Uh, again, fueling that, right? So that the next increment of compute, the next increment of data center is cheaper than the last. And so the average cost continues to decline even though load goes, uh, continues to, uh, to grow. Um, without these two forces controlling cost and the browser empowering uh, new applications to be uh, delivered without having software being distributed, the internet would really not have become what it is today. Of course, the browsers of today are different than the browsers of, uh, of 1996. Um, when I was at Livermore, we had a saying, I don't know what language I'll be using in five years, but it will be called Fortran. And, uh, and the similar uh, thing is, you know, uh, we still call it a browser, but it's a very different animal than what it was. Uh, back uh, 20, uh, 25 years ago. Um, 
For me, uh, I was recruited by John Doerr uh, from a famous uh, venture capital company to go found a new company called At Home. And we were uh, going to go out and build a new network delivering uh, broadband access using the cable infrastructure. Um, we used all three of these technologies, DWDM on the backbone, uh, the servers uh, uh, as caches initially, uh, and, uh, and the browser to, uh, to really give uh, people the ability to use a broadband connection in new ways uh, to advance, uh, advance the ball. And uh, uh, I think uh, I just want to conclude by saying, you know, all three of these trends have continued. Uh, today, uh, DWDM and, uh, and Photonics continue to deliver more and more capacity at lower cost. Uh, we have massive data centers. Certainly, my company, Google, uh, has those. Uh, the cost of storage is also declining. It makes it much more cost effective to put services in the cloud and uh, to push data closer to users. CDNs today uh, actually do what we used to use the caches in the network for, except they're now uh, pushing uh, a volume of data which is, uh, which is truly amazing. And web browsers continue to advance and empower better and better UIs. Now that you can get high definition video effectively play back uh, in your browser. Uh, I believe as long as these trends continue, the internet is going to continue to scale. But if DWM stops, if Moore's Law stops, we could be in for a world of hurt. Uh, let's hope uh, that the engineers and scientists who work on this uh, continue being innovative and uh, paving the way for new services uh, in the future. Uh, so that's all I have. Uh, I wanted to, uh, uh, if there's time, we could take a few questions. Questions from the old days. That doesn't work. Does not scale. <laughs> Anton Capella, Five Nines Data. Excellent presentation. Uh, thank you. I've seen a little bit of this work, uh, leftovers anyway, at uh, NASA Ames Research on various tours and friends. And the computer rooms still are seemingly pretty important for what's going on at the agency. Yeah. Uh, so some things haven't changed. One thing that also hasn't changed is um, some QoS stuff. Everyone knows I like QoS. Um, so back in the old days, or the previous days, uh, how much of this QoS interest was in prioritizing control protocols, not just the application layer three and stuff higher, but uh, EGP itself or things like that? Uh, you know, we, one of the most famous failures of the ARPANET occurred because um, the control traffic was routed at the same priority as data traffic, and basically the control system couldn't, couldn't, uh, couldn't converge quickly enough. Uh, we have had these kind of problems for, for some time uh, in the internet. I think, uh, you know, in general, uh, QS can be used, uh, we see QS used today by network operators on their internal networks, but we still don't have end-to-end -end QoS. Um, we don't have the settlement arrangements that, that, can, that can work. This was one of the topics back in the uh, late 80s that everybody was thinking, yeah, we're going to make QoS work, we're going to make it work end to end, because ATM did that. And we needed something that would do what ATM did in the internet. Um, actually, MPLS is now living uh, ATM's dream, if you want to think about it that way. Um, uh, and uh, a poor analogy, but, um, but we have uh, those kind of uh, switches now that can give us that kind of uh, QoS at the, uh, at the traffic management layer uh, and allowing our networks to scale in ways that ATM was supposed to do uh, but didn't. Yeah. Rob, C Rob Seastrom, I'm at Time Warner, these, Time Warner Cable these days, but many years ago I was an ankle-biting high school student who inhabited Dave Mills' lab at University of Delaware. Ah, yes. <clears throat> and, uh, I apologize for asking you a question at the mic, uh, which I probably should ask you in private. But when you brought up uh, Proteon, yeah. I was really hoping that you might uh, say something that would led, lend credence or rebuttal to the story that I have heard repeated to me a couple of times many years ago about not so easy this time, uh, a Milo. Yes. This is a very old story. Um, uh, 
I was relatively young in those days and um, unmarried. Um, I didn't get married till 38. Uh, and there was one holiday uh, at, uh, I think it was Memorial Day, and I was, the, the base was shut down, I didn't go into work, and I was totally <laughs> bored. And I couldn't figure out what to do. So I started doing a very odd thing. I did, I took the Proteon software executable, the runtime, and I piped it through strings in Unix, which printed out all these ASCII strings in the code. And I noticed there was this funny string that was located next to the word login. And then I uh, said, well, I wonder what? And I tried that, and it was a universal backdoor password. Uh, and uh, it, it turned out to uh, work on every Proteon in manufacture. Uh, Proteon had put it in for field service access and had figured nobody would ever think to look. Uh, and I called them up and I said, I read them the riot act, right? You can't put back doors and into, into uh, products that you sell. This is like a no-no. You've got to fix this. So they, they created a variable which would turn it on, right? Uh, and so you could, you, could, you could disable the field service password. No Chiappa at the time, right, uh, was uh, working for Proteon, and uh, he sent me, there was a new release, and said, Milo, did you try the new release? And I'm like, no. You have to try it. I'm like, fine, we loaded it in the lab. He says, so? I'm like, what do you mean? They had handcrafted a, in the exact same location in the, in the code, in the, in the executable, the words, not so easy this time, Milo, in the, uh, right where the old uh, password stored in the clear was. So that, this is the kind of fun we had in the old days. One more, that will go. Yeah, Kevin. Kevin Overman, ESNet. Uh, just wanted to thank you for mentioning some ancient network uh, terminology that has almost disappeared. Uh, things like RIP and EGP, particularly EGP, because there was recently a posting to the Nanog mailer uh, on the discussion of ASNs, and the comment made was, well, ASNs only goes back as far as BGP, because before BGP they were of no use for anybody. They didn't exist before then. <laughs> and I, I had to explain, yes, ASNs actually went back far before BGP. That's they right. were darn useful, even if the protocol wasn't. <laughs> Indeed. All right. Thank you for joining me on a little blast from the past. It is good to keep in mind the mistakes and foibles of the past as we move forward in the future together. Thank you.